do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. The principle of sowing and reaping is one principle with two outcomes. In the same way, we find one Garden of Eden, but two trees. Coincidence? Not at all. Or for once we understand that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil typifies the old covenant and law of God. Then we begin to recognize a pattern that leads us to understand what the tree of life represents. Remember, two is the number of division and witness. In the case of God's law, both are relevant. Might we then illustrate the principle of sowing and reaping in this fashion? When we truly understand the principle of sowing and reaping, we recognize that it addresses behavior. After all, how we behave with others usually determines how others behave with us. In confirmation, Paul goes on in Galatians 6 to say, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Putting it simply, doing good is good behavior, which the Bible speaks of as righteousness. The law exists to regulate behavior, which Oxford Languages defines as the way in which one acts or conducts oneself, especially toward others. In 1 John 3, 4, John wrote, sin is lawlessness. In most cases, this would be considered unacceptable behavior. I say most cases because someone who steals food because they are truly starving doesn't shout sin so much as it does grace. Am I right? So is it that, from our beginning, God placed us into the Garden of Eden, into the divine and universal principle of sowing and reaping, where the tree of knowledge represents the old covenant law of God, which addresses our propensity for lawlessness. But though it may address it, it cannot do anything to change it. As we have learned, the law provokes the very thing it condemns. And what prompts this lawlessness? Based on the statements of the serpent and the third component found in the tree of knowledge, it is pride, the inordinate love of the self. The first outcome of sowing and reaping declares, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. No doubt, flesh not only speaks to this human form in which we dwell, but to all of its attachments we maintain for its creature comforts. Remember, because we are in God's image, we are driven by desire, and desire is the manifestation of affection or love. It is our love for something that determines its place in our lives. So one must ask, why are we lawless? Answer, pride, our love for the self. I know, I sound like a broken record, don't I? but take time to really think about this. Using simple logic, if the tree of knowledge defines sowing to the flesh, then the tree of life must represent sowing to the spirit. The phrase eternal life in Galatians 6.8 confirms this, does it not? We find further confirmation in the following. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Here, my friend, is the component explaining the tree of life. Love, charity. The one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Where there is the love of the Spirit, there is no need for a law. When we sow to our flesh, 
we are loving ourself. When we sow to the Spirit, we are loving others as ourself. Here's why I say that the law of God addresses our propensity for lawlessness, but cannot change it. The only force capable of changing lawless behavior is that of love. Remember Paul's perplexity in Romans 7? Here's how he follows that. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Do you see it? The law or tree of knowledge is spiritual, the tree of life. Do you mean they are the same tree? They are. And just as this is true of our two trees, the same is true of the two covenants. For the new covenant is the placing of God's law into our minds and the writing of God's law into our hearts. First the law, then the matter of where it is written. First male, then female. First, knowledge, followed by an affection or love for this knowledge or truth. Now, in keeping with our perspective, let me share the following illustration with you. One principle, two outcomes, one tree. Also, two outcomes, one law addressing two natures. Let's revisit Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The seed of the word of God is living and active, where living speaks to the flesh and active speaks to the spirit. And just as sowing and reaping is one principle with two outcomes, so the word of God is one sword with two edges, able to pierce to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discern the innermost depths of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. First, a division within, as the active word of God challenges our carnal nature. Then, a witness of this word, when the spirit of God empowers us with his love, and brings forth the fruit of his spirit. Let me close with the following. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.